Great. So it's my warm and heartfelt pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this GRLI AGM. I'd like to welcome those of us in the room and also to extend that welcome to those who are not able to join us actually in this room due to time differences, for example, but we will be catching up via with, uh, the recording that we've done. A warm welcome to those people as well. This year, due to the incredible commitment and activity of the Guardians and John in developing and holding the pods and the beginning of Courageous Conversations, more of which you will hear about soon, we're able to make a much clearer distinction between the relational and the social elements of our gatherings and the business of the GRLI. So today might have a bit of a familiar feel to it to those of you who are uh, involved in governance and attend AGMs. But we must remember that for us, AGM stands for All Gathering Momentum. So this is the time of year when we take stock of where we've been together, we acknowledge what has been achieved, and we pause for a collective intake of breath before gathering our combined strength for what's to come. And none of us at this point know exactly what that will be. The Guardians have given this AGM the title of the Courage to Act. And in preparation for today and holding those two words, courage and action in mind, I discovered the following poem, which I would like to share with you. It recognizes the critical ingredients of action and stillness, waiting and wisdom, whilst also calling for us not to miss the moment, the opportunity to make our contribution. Right action at the wrong time serves no useful purpose. Stillness can be the most powerful action of all, just as action can reflect courage, waiting can reflect wisdom. But if we wait until we have permission, until it gets easier, or hell freezes over, we may miss the chance to act at all. If we wait for the perfect moment to come alive, we may discover that we have never lived at all. John. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for those words of welcome. Um, also from my side, a very warm welcome to everyone uh, joining us on the call today, as well as those that will be following this on the recorded version a bit later on. We essentially have two parts to the program, as you would have seen the agenda that, that, was, that was sent out. We are going to kick off with uh, a, a, a very uh, high level assessment of what's happened this year. And that includes hearing from a few of those are, that are on the call as to their experience of some of the key initiatives. We'll also take a quick look at the financials as we are obliged to. And also we will hear from the Guardians, uh, an uptake from Vanessa, who chairs the Guardians on their behalf. So that's the first part of the meeting. That we'll then have an opportunity to shift the energy and look ahead to, to next year. And that will include uh, again, a number of updates from those involved in various initiatives and, and actions. And towards the tail end of the meeting, there will be ratification required around some proposals that we have about the partnership. And then we'll bring it to a close. So to, to start off with where we are now, I thought it would be useful to remind everyone that in the latest uh, iteration of our strategic direction document called Towards 2030, we asked ourselves a number of questions. We asked ourselves, how might GRI develop a future picture of what global responsibility looks like in 2030 that informs the pathways and the milestones and the actions of our work so that we could eventually look back on this decade as what we 
called the regenerative twenties. So imagine we arrive in 2030, we look back on this decade as the regenerative twenties. We also asked how do we help those tools and approaches and learning that perhaps exists on the fringe emerge to prominence in order to help shape the next normal as opposed to the new normal that has often been referred to. And we also asked in developing that future picture, how do we decide on and prioritize our efforts and our actions so that it makes global responsibility a reality in leadership and practice. And at the start of 2021, we launched the What's Important Now dashboard, which of course is on our website. And that continues to track the key pathways of our work, as well as the actions that are in place for GOI to fulfill its purpose. But it's not static. The intention, of course, is that through our gatherings and meetings like today's, that we will continually update the pathways and the actions that support us. The key pathways of our work deals with the ecosystem in terms of us helping steward the landscape of initiatives. It deals with governance, or as we call the taking care of the vehicle of the GLI, which is the governance, the finance, etc. Then there's the essential purpose, which is around building new pathways to global responsibility. And that's really core to, to, to the GLI. We exist, after all, because we share this unfolding story of how global responsibility is developed. That inquiry mode is actually essential and core to our purpose. The fourth one is around engagement, which is about deepening the relationships within and amongst the various institutions and individuals that helps drive the GLI's work. And then the final one is around exploration or discovering new territories or new pathways towards the development of global responsibility. And of course, there's been a number of initiatives that if you trace their origin back a number of years, then you will realize that in some way or another, Many of these initiatives are connected to the GLI's inquiry. We were very happy during this year and fortunate to be able to welcome on this journey a number of new partners as well. Firstly, I think it's quite significant and most of you know this by now to have Oikos International joining us as a strategic partner. Of course, we have the Global Compact as a founding strategic partner, and we continue, and we are very happy to have and very fortunate to have AACSB and EFMD providing the foundation of the GLI's work through their foundational contributions. For the first time in since I can remember, in fact, yeah, for the first time since I've been involved on a full-time basis, we have a full list of institutional partners We've always, we've placed a cap on that in terms of having only 25 full partners. And this year, we were very happy to welcome back into the GLI, uh, Babson. And I see, I think Wendy's on the call as well today. So we're very happy to have Babson back as a partner. Uh, Grossman School of Business that hosted one of the, one of the Dean's cohort meetings and has been very active in that space, joined as a partner. Loyola Marymount University joined as a partner. The College of Business Administration also very involved in the Dean's Cohort since the outset. Javiskala University's Business and Economics in Finland has previously engaged at associate partner level and have stepped up to becoming a full partner. And we've welcomed the Montessori Group, which of course is focused more on early childhood development and kind of primary school level, which is, a, which is a wonderful development in that it really starts moving our partnership group beyond the higher education and uh, higher and further education and exec ed space. So that's just a, a quick snapshot of, of, of where we stand in terms of partners. Then in terms of associates and their I include our associate partners, so these, this is institutional alignment. We welcomed uh, George Mason and Leadership Global as associate partners. Um, and of course, they join a, a group that's been involved for a number of years now. And then because of 
the cohort becoming uh, quite virtual over the last year. We created just to make it easier and, and to maybe develop a, a further pipeline of potential future partners and associate partners. We created a category called cohort associates. This is where the dean and one or two learning partners to the dean of an institution joins the joins the deans and directors cohort. And we had we had the list of institutions shown there join us as cohort associates. Um, but it should be noted that the dean's cohort is bigger than just that group because there are a number of our existing partners and associates are of course also taking part. And then of course we also have uh, a, a category for individuals who don't hold an institutional alignment in respect of the GLI. For my side, with, with, with immense gratitude for to our partners and associates and, and strategic partners for helping enable the GLI's work. So <clears throat> coming into 2021, as you can imagine, things were pretty uncertain. And what you're looking at, hopefully you can see on your screen, is our conservative budget that we had for 2021 and we also had a low road scenario so we we were preparing ourselves if things were really bad what might we do given the circumstances the third column over here is what we think we're going to end up with at the end of this year so that's based on data from the end of october so our projected results for this year i'm very glad to say looks like we will uh, be meeting or possibly even exceeding our approved conservative budget for the year. We're very thankful for that. And, and also our partners, strategic partners and associate partners contribute basically all of our income <laughs> in light of what I would argue is going to be continued uncertain operating circumstances. We're proposing to the board that we maintain a conservative budget for 2022. I think notably, we've also decided that the fee increase that was approved by the partnership in 2020 will again be placed on hold. So again, for next year, we will not be making any increases in the contribution levels of partners and associates. Is there anyone who has any questions or comments about this at this point? We, of course, have an audit committee within the board that, that, that takes care of, of this. But just in case there are any kind of immediate questions or, or comments, um, I'll, I'll be happy just to take one or two. And please just feel free to unmute and speak up if there's anything. There's a comment from Chris in the chat. Uh, Jonathan, uh, in the chat. Currency. Oh, my apologies. Yes, yeah, sorry, Chris. That was on a slide that, that I didn't show. So it's, it's euros. So we're, as a Belgian foundation, we're, we're operating euros. Okay. Any anything else? M moving along, then I thought in order to just to bring twenty twenty one to life a bit more, I thought I would just invite um, a few people just to share um, very briefly their reflections and experiences. And I thought maybe we could start with the dean's cohort. And I know that we have a number of people on the call here that have been that have formed part of that. I thought maybe if we could ask. Wendy Murphy, Wendy, if you could maybe just share a little bit, and then also Owen Sky from Rhodes Business School, just to give us a flavor of your kind of experience of the cohort. Wendy, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to talk. I think it's important anytime you're part of an organization like this, it's affected by both your individual place where you are and the organizational state when you join. And when we came back as Babson, it was through a strategic initiative that our faculty initiated as part of our curriculum change. And so I was uh, co-leading that change. And as we joined, we were also in the middle of that. So the timing for me in joining was actually really wonderful for me personally, but organizationally a tumultuous time over and above the pandemic actually hitting. And so what I've found through this group has been a tremendous benefit in terms of the validation for your experience and, and my experience through the crisis of the pandemic. It was so helpful for me to hear 
that others were experiencing similar stressors and challenges with both students and faculty, as well as the administrative challenges of simply paying for all of the PPE, et cetera, through the crisis. So that was really helpful. So that was the first thing I wanted to identify. The second is because where because of where I was both personally and organizationally, I spent a lot of this year in listening and learning mode. It was going to be impossible for us to start any new institutional partnerships or any curriculum initiatives, given we were in the middle of our own curriculum change. So the good news is that we got through that and started rolling it out this fall. And so we're now poised to really do some exciting new potential development work. So the third thing that I found through this group is a high amount of inspiration. And actually, Claire, I'm going to ask you to send me the poem that you read. Part of the role of being a dean and director, as many of you, feels like moving from meeting to meeting. And even today, I have to step out for a meeting during this meeting. And so giving each other the space and the time to actually reflect and be thoughtful and strategic is something that I incredibly value. And I've, I'm really excited to share that we finally I finally hired an admin to manage my calendar. It's been an opening for about three months. And what I've found is I'm not that good at making sure things are balanced in my calendar. And so I really do appreciate the space that we create here together. It's a safe space and a trusting space. And I really genuinely hold that dear. So thank you for the opportunity. Marlon, you wanted to maybe just give us a, your update? Uh, thanks, John. I hope I'm, I'm loud and clear there. And yeah, just to say that we're sorry, South Africa, sorry that we identify this variant because it seems it would cause a bit of chaos in the world, but be that as it may, I, Rose Business School has been involved with the GRLI for a long time, ever since I was director, but I never actually uh, had an opportunity to participate in the, in the physical face-to-face -face events. My colleague, Letitia Freiling, was, was driving that with my full support. So I, I guess the positive about the pandemic is that uh, suddenly we discovered that we could meet virtually. So I must admit, you know, the first time I joined, I was a little bit apprehensive because didn't know too many people, <clears throat> but any doubts that I had about that were quickly put to, to bed. And so I've really enjoyed the refreshing and innovative way in which we engage around uh, very profound issues. And I really uh, am sincere in saying that the way in which we are committed to doing this is, is completely authentic in this focus to to drive this responsible leadership agenda. <clears throat> and it's very powerful how, when you see everybody, your face is there now, and just sort of connect that if somebody's in Finland, somebody's in the US, somebody's, it's almost humbling that we can come together and talk about these issues and discover that there's more commonality than there is difference. I think with our commitment for uh, our responsible leadership essence uh, for sustainability, you sometimes think that you're speaking down an echo chamber. Uh, and so just uh, building on what Wendy said, this opportunity to come together and hear that uh, we're not alone. And I've really enjoyed the interactions. We picked up some really fantastic ideas uh, and we're building them consistently into the programs that we offer. So you know, strength to everybody, uh, the courage to act. I think you know, we can take a vote of confidence in ourselves that we're doing that. But I think we also acknowledge that there must come a time and a place where we can meet once again, person to person. I think it's, we've missed the opportunity to have the kind of socializing. I, I did hear from Letitia in the past that there's some fantastic socializing events and that's often where sort of collegiality and friendships are forged even further so hopefully uh, 2022 will bring that opportunity and, and, and we look forward to taking that further so thank you to the guardians for maintaining your custodianship and thank you to the board for making sure that we 
on the straight and narrow, and we look forward to further collaboration. And thank you to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Owen and Wendy, also for just that, that update. Um, and we will hear a little bit later on about the cohort prospects for next year, including the possibilities of also meeting face to face. One of the other developments this year, also largely because of us having to meet more virtually, has been the pod gatherings. I was going to ask Anna Semaines at Ishte whether she wouldn't mind maybe just giving us a short reflection. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, John, and good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone in this AGM. Just a quick note, uh, John. It's been two years, remember the pre-COVID world where we met, when we met in Lisbon, the sunny Lisbon. Well, it was raining a little bit, but normally <laughs> it's still sunny today, cold but sunny. So it's been two years since our last in-person AGM. So I think that I'll take the opportunity to remind all of us and those that were present how nice it was to host you at the Ishkate Business School. And hopefully we can repeat this in the near future, sooner than later. Regarding the pods, so just uh, some quick notes about the pods. So the, for, for those that may be less familiar with the, the, the format. So the pods are small informal group gatherings uh, that are open to any partner and associate representatives that wish to engage in ongoing shared learning and collaboration that builds on relational approaches. So it's really a moment when we can come together and, and discuss uh, important topics. They take about 90 minutes and there are virtual sessions and they provide a touch point for the July committee in between the AGM uh, gatherings and other meetings and have become an important way of keeping the July community connected to each other and the work we are doing individually and collectively. The inaugural pod gathering was in April, back in April. Normally there are two slots depending on the time zone. So you can choose the one that is more appropriate to your schedule. And the Guardians group initiated a discussion about the elements that form part of the July rolling and ongoing call to action. Then in May, we had an input from, in the form of a, a Nobel Laureate Collective call, which was in, that was launched in April, if I remember well called Our Planet, Our Future Emergent uh, Call to Action. And so that was the starting point for the discussion that month. Then in May, we strove to increase the diversity in terms of perspectives. So we invited partners and associates to bring a plus one uh, to the conversation and have kept that arrangement in place since then. This, of course, uh, may be someone that represents a critical or unheard perspective that we believe can be important for the context of our work. And some, that may not be still related to your life. So it can be a way of getting those involved with us. And of course, with this, we hope to uh, weave a richer tapestry uh, of perspective on developing global responsibility. Finally, uh, in September, we referred to a, an essay describing the meta crisis. And again, we discussed uh, as well uh, what can we do regarding this. Personally, and from my point of view, the pods, uh, the partner pods have been very valuable both in terms of the concepts and the process uh, and the format, of course, it helps us coming together uh, because uh, this is the ability to come together to get to know more partners and associate representatives to discuss topics that are urgent and uh, that resonate to our mission as individual institutions, as individuals uh, and as July as a whole, of course, while opening doors for the collaboration uh, among each other. So. It's an informal way of joining forces to the much needed call to action. So that these are my thoughts, John, to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for, for giving us a, a brief summary there. 
and your reflections on the value of the pod gatherings. And of course, there's been some other gatherings that we've recently initiated as well, the Courageous Conversations, but we'll get on to those when we look ahead to 2022. We've looked at the finances. We've heard a snapshot on some of the initiatives, but I think a key part of, of bringing us up to speed with where we are now is to hear from the Guardian Group. It's my pleasure to hand over to Vanessa Duffenfield at Betty's. Vanessa, if you could maybe give us your update. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And hi, everybody. This is just a short update, really, because I think most of the work that we've been holding as Guardians has been described in the pods and the, the future Courageous Conversations work. But the focus for, the, for us this year has been on strengthening the connections and thinking ahead to what we can contribute as a Guardians group to support the development of the Jira life for the future. So I'd like just to take an opportunity as part of that strengthening to welcome Jeff, who's here. If you wave, Jeff. Hi. Um, and Hannah Lena. Um, I don't think he's here at the minute, but uh, to, to the Guardians group, who are our newest members joining this year. So we're really delighted, and I'm really delighted, that we are strengthening the relationships that we have between the Guardians so that we're able to continue to hold a robust dialogue about how we truly live into our purpose and steward the dualized values into the future. And this year we sought to develop the new ways of strengthening how we communicate and engage with the council of partners as has just been described alongside John. So we've made progress on the new rhythms and our focus is really on rhythms and relationships that sustain dialogue and catalyze action, predominantly through the initiating partner pods beginning and again through courageous conversations and more of that later. And as we've developed more of the structure around the Guardians group, our attention has since shifted to the work that we do together in our time and our role in amplification and action, how we bridge activities and promote connection, including how we might model a different way of self and peer based approaches to hold ourselves accountable and each other accountable to the work and doing more of that amplification over the next few years. So we've got more to develop in the new year on that thinking, but some really good discussion and ideas emerging for us aligned to the wider areas of focus for the GRLI, which will be shared later in the AGM. Um, this year, I just want to just take a moment to say we've also closed some of the long-standing Guardian relationships. And today, just to confirm that both JC and Anna, who are on the call, um, have stepped down as Guardians in this last period. When I was a new member into the GRLI, I was welcomed by Mary Godfrey, but it was still quite a nerve wracking place to come. And certainly from a business perspective and not a university background. And both um, JC and Anna welcomed me with open arms. It was a really new experience for me, but I felt supported to contribute and included from the outset. And I must also say, Arnold, you were part of that as well. And so thank you so much for your continued support, both of you. It's amazing how much, how much you've been able to steward the Guardians and the GRLI over such a long period. I know you both wish to retain and share and can take, continue to have a strong connection into the future, but thank you personally and on behalf of the Guardians for all of um, the part you've played for so many years. So that's, that's us really. I think our, our real focus will be about how do we live into the generalized wider, broader focus areas for the year ahead, but really amplification of, of ourselves, the role of the guardians. Thanks, John. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I think it gives us a, a snapshot. And before we on to, to looking ahead uh, to, to next year, maybe this is an opportunity for us to shift the energy a bit. So I'm going to invite everyone just to stand up for a moment and see if we can shake some of, I know it's not entirely finished yet, but shake some of 2021 off a bit because we are now going to be looking ahead to 2022. 20, uh, now, in order to, to do this, some of you are familiar with this little affirmation. What you want to do is you want to face your palms outwards to the person next to you, either side. So for instance, I have Vanessa and Anders over here that I'm touching, okay? So that way we are all connected. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to repeat four words, but I'll only do the first word and then you repeat the first word. Then I'll repeat two words, the first two words, and you can repeat them just softly. And then when I say all four words, I want you to put up your hands, still holding it, put up your hands and shout those four words. Okay, so here we go. Okay, repeat after me. We. Oui. 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 Okay, so you might want to unmute yourself at this point. <laughs> Sorry. Unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let's start again. Okay. So. We, we. we are. We are. are. We are here. We are here. We are here, we are here now. We, we are here, here now. 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 Oh, great. We are here now. Whilst we're standing, let's just put in a wave to everyone who can't be here. And you're missing out, but we, we're glad that you're watching the recording. So I invite you to take a seat. Okay. Looking ahead to 2020. I'll just put up the slide again. We have, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a very brief overview. And then we have a number of people, most of them on the call, but where they, where they couldn't join us, I'll try and fill in best I can. And so this is going to be a fairly rapid round of kind of updates um, on various things happening in the landscape. So let me start with kind of ne with next year and at least the, the four quarters. So what you're looking at is a fairly busy slide, admittedly. But I thought I would just give you a flavor of how we plan out the year in summary across the four quarters and the various streams of work that are typically under discussion when the core team uh, gets together and, and looks at what needs to be done. So running across the top, of course, we have our governance, which provides the rhythm, really the foundation. We, we set our board meetings out one year in advance. The Guardian meetings typically align back to the board meetings in some form or another. We will also put out another call for board and Guardian members in quarter one of next year. And there's a process underway for appointment of additional advisors. So these are people who advise my office or some of the advisor terms that are up for renewal. And then, of course, within the board, we have various subcommittees looking after governance, looking after the audit, which usually takes place in quarter two when we produce our audit report. And then there's some other admin involved in updating our directorship and things like that. In the second stream of work, we have communications, operations and finance. And we've recently looked at what do we do? Could we perhaps get some volunteers to help us because we only have part-time communication support, very ably provided by Claire Summer, who's on the call today. So we'll be looking at, at getting some additional kind of partner or otherwise involvement in the communication strategy. We are in the process of transferring our blog over to WordPress. Typically in quarter one, we do our invoicing. Um, and for next year, we'd like at least to, to see if we can get two newsletters out per quarter and three blog articles per quarter. There's also the possibility around quarter three of maybe getting some interns in. We've been speaking with TIG, which is the intern group. They have, they have developed a, a, an innovative new virtual internship program. And we are specifically working with them to see whether we could perhaps get three interns representing the global south to to spend some time supporting the core team so that's kind of the stream focused on communication operations and finance and again this is by no means entirely comprehensive it's just to give you a, a snapshot on the engagement side uh, we're going to be talking in, in a moment about the courageous conversations we'll continue with the pods so the pods and the courageous conversations alternate months We'll be inviting some more um, um, associates uh, in quarter one. And of course, we have our Responsible Leadership Reimagined Conference taking place, uh, hosted by Stellenbosch. It's the academic conference in March. We'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. So that stream 
is of engagement is typically around our pods, courageous conversations and, and our AGM. And then on the initiative side, again, this is by no means comprehensive, but we'll hear a little bit about a shared module that's being piloted. We have, until very recently, we were planning to have a face-to-face -face Dean's cohort in Stellenbosch, but we'll hear an update now from Mark Smith because we are in the process of rethinking that. And then there's a responsible leadership video series, which which Nicola has been holding and she's interviewing a number of people. I think in the previous newsletter, we already put out the initial material around Joe Medias and the Gram Vikas case. Uh, she's interviewing Paul Polman, I think in January. And so we'll have the recording of that in quarter two. And there was a question raised by Hannah Lehner about possibly doing a shared MOOC on the growth dilemma. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about a potential summit jointly held with the Oikos in Q Q3 of next year. And throughout, also on the initiative side, the Dean's Code continuing, uh, some virtual, some in person, but of, of course to be to be confirmed. All of that whilst keeping an eye on the wider ecosystem. And this is our immediate ecosystem, our strategic partners, and some of the some of those events that we typically engage in on, on an annual basis with some of our allies or our friends like for instance GBSN or the RME conference and so forth. So I wanted to just give you a, a very high level snapshot of the, the rhythm of next year but from here on I would rather we hear from the various people who are closer to the detail. Now we have, I'm just quickly looking at the timing here, so we're going to try and keep these updates to three minutes or less if possible. I'm, I am going to keep uh, time just to keep us honest. And feel free to kick us off, Wayne and Jeff, if you don't mind. Maybe I'll kick off uh, just to say that we've made uh, good, good progress. Sometimes it feels slow, but uh, we have now eight institutions collaborating to uh, Put forward a brilliant online diverse course spanning Thailand, Australia, Europe, the UK, and America. Coming at sustainable transformation, responsible leadership from different angles. Jeff, maybe you want to say where we're at in the process? Yeah, so we we have our pilot group that's meeting every two weeks. We've established three working groups. And one is to work on the ongoing question of logistics and uh, coordination of logistics. Another is to build out uh, the collaborative project that would be part of the student experience. And then finally, uh, there's a specific group related to GDPR regulations and how that factors into the way in which we work among ourselves. There's, as uh, Wayne said, there's eight participants. And it, right now, it's shaking out that about four of them will be using this as an executive education program, and the other four will be using it as some form of class or coursework within their academic programs. And we're meeting every two weeks and working to navigate building out the specifics of the way in which we're going to implement the plan. And uh, we have a meeting next week where we will finalize overall schedule and make sure that the structure of our ongoing meeting and our work together is is working well the grli has been hosting a share drive and we've been using that as the platform of our communication with one another and we're navigating it and running into the inevitable kind of challenges and complexities as we're working through how each of our organizations interface with this but as wayne said we're making good progress the final thing i'd quickly add is that there's another set of participants that are interested in doing this in the fall. So we're inviting them to our meeting so that we can give them a, sh a share the an update of what our current mm -hmm. status is with the intention of building out a second pilot group that would work out their fall plan. The understanding of those that are doing it in the spring is that we will not be repeating it in the fall. We would be doing what we do every spring. So we would see the possibility of parallel groups working and building out their own plans, but we'll have more understanding of that uh, next week. 
Great. And if, if there's any questions for clarification, we've got about a minute left. If anyone wanted to ask a question of Jeff and Wayne. Okay, but we know where to get hold of you. Wayne, did you want to ask something? No, I would just say if any of you are in those institutions who, you know, expressed interest in the course, but not yet, that spring was too early, then uh, do make sure that you're on the list for potentially the, uh, the pilot later next year. So that would be round about September to November uh, so that you can start working in parallel as a group of institutions. And uh, you could either reach out to, uh, to John or myself or Jeff and make sure that you're on that list. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Wayne, for, for that update, and also to everyone else who is working away on, on making that real. Since this is a wonderful example of uh, collective action that is, in this case, emerged from the Dean's cohort, but is growing beyond the Dean's cohort, I thought let's maybe turn next to the Dean's cohort. We've already heard some reflections on, one, on, on what people are experiencing, but I thought maybe, Mark, whilst you're still on the call, you could maybe just give us a quick... Uh, update from as to what we might expect if we are if we're able to come to Stellenbosch. Thanks, John. Yeah, it was John and I were discussing. I think right up to last Thursday, we were uh, we were planning to poll the deans to say to set to do a save the date and see how many people would be prepared to travel on the the weekend after the responsible leadership con conference, which would have been. The, something like 19, 18, 19, 20, 21 of March. And then about 12 hours later, then uh, up pops the, uh, um, the, the new version of COVID. And uh, we decided not to poll you because that seemed a little bit uh, foolhardy to, uh, to collect your opinions in, in, the, in the maelstrom of, uh, of news that's, uh, that's, that's, be that's come out since then. <coughs> we still have a, say, a block in that. Well, we're still hosting the conference, the academic conference, in the preceding days, and I, I think it's better that Arnold says something about that as the as, as the lead on that on, on that. But that's in a beautiful location in the in the in the Western Cape near near, near Stellenbosch. But we had thought to tack on to the end of that the the, the dean's cohort, and John and I discussed with my colleagues here in Stellenbosch about having a kind of the previously dean's cohort. <laughs> And I'd never been to one before, but have had a common thread, and we thought uh, it was quite in, it, perhaps interesting to pose a common thread of resilience, responsibility, and relevance, which I, I believe something has already been discussed in the, in the GRLI as well, in the, in the cohort in the past. We thought that mapped onto themes that we've been discussing in the GRLI, but also in, into issues and things we could explore in the Western Cape. A resilience in terms of the challenges that we face in front of in face of climate change inequalities water shortages in the in in, in south africa and we have particular the interesting partnerships and and uh, in projects we could have visited and explored in that relation in relation to the water shortages that the cape faced five years ago and now uh, have, have come back from uh, responsibility in terms of responsible leadership and our responsibility as an educational institution to different stakeholders in among the community around us, both linked to the conference, but also to our work with small businesses in the area, and also relevance for the local relevance, the final R, the relevance for the local context and our ecosystem, whether that's for the uh, bigger businesses in the, in the in the Western Cape, but also small businesses, entrepreneurs, unemployed townships and the, the, the general needs of emerging economy as in a, a business called an emerging economy compared to uh, richer economies of, of the north. So we're still in that, we're in a, a pause, I would say. Is that fair to say, John? Um, yes, we, uh, yeah, thanks for that, that, Mark. So, no, absolutely. So, so unfortunately, we've, well, uh, as it has often happened over the last two years, one plans something and COVID happens. So what we will mo most likely do is we will most likely go ahead with the virtual meeting. Uh, um, and I think like, seeing as we've set aside the 18th to the 21st, it probably makes sense to, to tag this to the 18th, 19th of March. 
we have our ever and it's i think it's also in the slides that we sent out we'll do some planning around the cohort as a whole for next year on the 14th of december with a follow-up on the 17th of january and so the deans that are part of the cohort and I, by that i include the associate deans will receive invites for the 14th if you can't make it then the 17th of january because we do need to look about at the longer term uh, structure of the cohort I think the uh, proposal um, mark of, of, of responsibility, resilience, and relevance is, is still going to be relevant. <laughs> so please watch the space. But we are uh, very keen to continue supporting the development of the cohort. It's really been, uh, I, I guess, as close to a, a flagship initiative of the GLI as one we can get over the last few years. I think since we're speaking about Stellenbosch, maybe it's a good time just to turn to Arnold. Arnold, if you could just give us a very brief update on the Responsible Leadership Reimagined Conference. Thank you, John. And from my side, good afternoon, uh, everybody. John, allow me just a quick reflection on some of the previous um, inputs in this meeting. It made me think about what C.S. Lewis said. We read to know that we are not alone. I've always felt like this in this kind of company of the general eye, it's a benchmarking opportunity. It's a feeling not alone opportunity. And I also think that from that perspective, uh, this is where a conference like what we are planning also fits into the picture. So the conference theme is responsible leadership reimagined, but with a specific focus on the African continent, which means that we are not just looking for contributions from Africa, but a conversation that can also bring the African continent into the broader global conversation around responsible leadership. We are currently in the process um, of reviewing papers, and we will make that decision shortly in terms of which papers, practitioner and scholarly papers, will eventually go into the conference. The structure of the conference, I think, is very appetizing. The first day will focus on the research agenda. The second day, more so on responsible management education. And the last day would be focusing on the responsible business agenda. Mornings will typically start with, with keynotes. Uh, I, I want two keynotes that you might uh, recognize would be that of Nicola Pless and Jonathan Gosling. That'll be followed by panel conversations around the various themes, followed then also by paper and uh, practitioner presentations. And then the afternoons will be typical general I type co-creative laboratory type design sessions because we would like the conference to have an afterlife. So that it's not just about conferencing, but also ongoing co-creative work after the conference, which I think is very exciting. At the moment, what we can say is that it's all pandemic dependent, whether we will be in Stellenbosch or not. That call we will also make in the same week of January that you have just referred to, John, more or less around the 20th of January. And we will let everybody there know whether we're going to go just online or whether we would like to continue with a hybrid format. We wish for the hybrid, but this, this new discovery labeled Omicron, I think, disrupted a few of these decisions uh, somewhat but we will keep you up to date and the conference website will also be alive shortly within the next uh, few days. And we will also update you on that when that happens. So that's from my side, any questions I would be uh, like to answer. It. And I see we also have Anna's name against the conference. I don't know, Anna, whether you wanted to add anything to Arnold's update, because I know you've been key in the call for papers process. Oops, can't hear you. Oh, you're on mute. No. No, not yet. Oops, no. I can just mean say that Anna is part of our STIRCOM helping to organize the Okay. Okay, no. Not yet, Anna. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what's happened. <laughs> okay, but what, what, glad to have you here, Anna, and thank you very much for helping steer the conference. Much appreciated. I, 
uh, neither Simon nor Nicola can join us on the call today. Nicola has had to travel rather urgently. I met with Simon last week. I'm just going to give a very brief update. Simon and I actually had a conversation about scaling of responsible leadership. And for those of you who haven't met Simon yet, he's um, the head of learning and development at EcoBank, and he's one of our guardians. He's a by invite guardian. He was previously connected to one of our alumnus partners, which is the Center for Creative Leadership. And so when Simon and I had this conversation, e EcoBank, by the way, is a very large bank in Africa. Simon's based in Togo. And uh, when we had this conversation, we realized that, that there are three, at least in our view, three things that are missing in the responsible leadership development space. And that the small to medium enterprise size organization is a, a perhaps a more relevant area to focus our energies in terms of business leadership. As some as, as, yeah, and uh, the three abilities or characteristics, if you want to call them, that we felt were perhaps missing were the critical awareness of leaders in small to medium enterprises, the critical awareness about issues of global responsibilities, the moral courage to act once they know what has happened, what, what, what is happening and what role they have and what influence they can have. Um, and then finally, having a globally inclusive perspective and an in, and, and integrative approach in action. And as we were talking about this, we realized that what would be absolutely wonderful is if we had five small to medium enterprises on each continent, if we do divide the world into kind of five continents, depending on how you prefer. In other words, to form a... A, a group of around 25 small to medium enterprises looking at at forming a, a an SME leadership cohort. Now, so this is very much an, 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 an early days in terms of this idea, and Simon and I will continue working on that, but he wanted me to share this with the group here, and there may be some potential overlap or synergy with existing initiatives. But if there is someone on the call or listening to the recording who would be interested in helping drive a business leadership cohort for SMEs, then please get in touch with myself and Simon. And that's that update. And then moving on to the video series, um, already starting last year, Nicola Place conducted a video uh, uh, interview series with Peter Woofley. She followed it up with some work that she had previously recorded and now re more recently written on, which is with Joe Madia at Gran Vicas. Uh, she's going to be speaking to Paul Polman shortly, but the idea is that we start building up a library of kind of examples or, or inspiring responsible leadership stories. And, uh, and she's doing this on top of her teaching and, and other work. She's also one of our guardians. If any of you are interested in supporting the development of a library of video conversations and recordings with uh, leaders and civil society, business and otherwise, that you think may hold learning about responsible leadership and the development thereof, then please feel free to get in touch with myself or Nicola. So that's uh, just a quick update on that one. Um, and let me uh, hand over for the next one to John Knight. And John, I'll back you up if there's anything that you feel I can add to the update. Thank you. I think I'll probably need some backup and certainly some guidance. We're looking at doing an inquiry into transpersonal leadership. And uh, let me explain a little bit of background. The <clears throat> As leadership, we've been working on developing a journey for leaders over the last 20 plus years, which we've called trans the transpersonal leadership journey, which is about raising uh, the awareness of leaders, helping them with their emotional intelligence, and then helping them to bring their values to full consciousness in the decisions that they make and their stakeholder management. 
and we think we've been pretty successful with that. It's been accredited to master's degree level. But at the moment, what we do is we deal with, tend to deal with senior leaders. And it, it, it always makes me think that if the education system was better, then we wouldn't be needed because these people would already be on that journey at a much younger age. So the question is, how can we, how can we integrate or utilize the journey that we've developed to bring it to further along the chain into society through, through education, through higher education, even through early education. Ultimately, I believe that, that the development of social skills and, uh, and community skills, et cetera, et cetera, should be mainstream in, in uh, primary education. And at that, if we could do that, that's a long-term goal. But if we could do that, it would certainly make or enable us to have much better leaders in the world today. And an article was published in EFMD in January this year, which sort of uh, explains that in some detail. But one of the reasons that we as leadership were interested in joining GRLI was actually because of the opportunity of not only engaging with higher education, but actually engaging with the whole concept of, of global leadership. And with John's guidance, we've come up with this idea of an inquiry or a collaboratory, I guess that was the other word you used, John, <laughs> into transpersonal leadership about how it can be moved from the development of individual leaders through, org through organizations and into society and through education into society. And uh, we'd be very interested in, in leading or co-leading an inquiry into that and would be very interested to have anybody participating with us from the GRLI community. Right, thank you very much, John. I, I don't have anything else to add because I think you've described it very well. This is an inquiry into transpersonal leadership. And again, if you're interested in supporting and getting involved in that, John and I have started working on a kind of a concept note that can serve also as an invite to potential participants. Uh, please do get in touch. Moving on to uh, the Courageous Conversations. Oh, thank you. Matthew has just shared the link to uh, John's article on transpersonal leadership. So if you have a look at the chat, then you'll be able to pick up that article in Global, uh, Global Focus magazine. So I've invited Chris Taylor just to give us a kind of a preview of one of the Courageous Conversations, which may turn into a Courageous Conversation series, potentially, based on some work that he's been doing. Some of you may already be aware of this. So, Chris, over to you. Thanks, John. <clears throat> I'm conscious there's been a lot of input and lots to keep up with for everybody. Just give me a wave if you're still here. <laughs> okay, good. Great. <laughs> Nice to see. Thank you. <laughs> so you've heard a bit about Courageous Conversations and uh, that they will be uh, present throughout the whole of the coming year, roughly at, at quarterly intervals, but possibly every two months. And I'll be kicking off the series in uh, 2022 with perhaps the most challenging conversation um, of our age, perhaps also the most emotive conversation of our age, which is, are we going to survive? Are we going to get through this? And if so, how? So for the past three years, I've been looking at this in Oasis, reviewing all the literature, working with a whole range of organisations on this, and we'll be publishing a suite of reports in January about the prospect of uh, global collapse, how real it might be, what are the drivers, and how do we get through it? How do we create resilience at the personal level, at the organizational level, at the community level, to, to 
suffer the shocks uh, and get through the shocks? And how do we move from an extractive approach to our economy and uh, our global system from extraction moving towards regeneration? So that's the first conversation. So if that excites you, scares you, inspires you, then please join us uh, in February. Great, thank you, Chris. Chris, of course, an, uh, an associate at OASIS School for Human Relations. And Chris, would you maybe just remind us the date that we provisionally set in February for that? Yeah, we've penciled in the 23rd of February. Okay. The time so we hopefully to suit different time zones. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. My great pleasure in now turning over to Sophie Shara, who is the president, co-president now of Oikos International. Sophie, maybe you want to just say a little bit about yourself and about Oikos for those that haven't met you yet, and then we can talk a little bit about the summit and what we've been discussing. Yes, totally. Thanks, John. Good to be here with all of you. I'm Sophie, and Oikos is a student community where um, spread out in over 50 cities worldwide and yeah AUKUS is about a new way of leading together and it is about changing our own education as well so we have a similar aspiration here with the GRLI and we also hold up similar questions which is really relevant and it's also why we decided now to partner up as strategic partners actually and I joined the board recently which is a great honor yeah, and regarding the summit or whatever name it's gonna hold in the end. Jonathan and I think also uh, Chris, you were there at the beginning as well when it was around a year ago, we were started talking about the pot potential gathering of the ecosystem. And I think when I read in the chat something about a safe space to think and maybe even feel beyond the next meeting. And when I connected it to the we are here now. So the sense of connection to the now, then I feel it really makes sense. What we were talking about first was really holding up a mirror to ourselves and understand what we know actually, what, what is happening, what is becoming relevant as we speak to each other, sitting with the different kinds of crisis on the different scales and what is our role in it. But also, what is becoming clearer right now, also listening to Claire's poem at the beginning, is, okay, what is the wise action we actually need? What is next? Because we play a role in it, and we can find these pockets of courage wherever we look, if we really take the time to look at it. Yeah, we had the beginning of this conversation, the beginning of brainstorming about, okay, how could this look like? Where should this actually take place and who would be invited. Yeah, and we're also still looking for someone who might want to chip in and also help us shaping this co-creative um, space. And John, maybe you have something to add <laughs> at this stage still. Yeah, I think maybe just thank you so much, uh, Sophie, for that. I think maybe just to echo that in, in part, this was also Picking up on some of our learning from the 2018 meeting at Kedge, where we where we realized that to work beyond our logo, we need to create a space where various initiatives and networks feel welcome to do their work and then perhaps connect them with each other. And as Sophie says, hold up a, a mirror to the ecosystem and figure out where we stand and what we can do together. So it very much builds on previous experience and we have there's a program within oikos which some of you may be familiar with called future lab and so we thought possibly we could we could link the work of that oikos is, is doing right now around it's around reimagining its future lab events possibly link that to such a summit and if I have to dream really big, then maybe an output of that would be that we have a, a, a report on the state of global responsibility. 
that we can update from time to time and say, this is where global responsibility is at right now. So thank you very much, Sophie, for that. Once again, an invite. If any of you have energy or interest in helping coordinate or support such a, such a summit as a placeholder term, then please do get in touch with us. And then I would like to hand over to, let me see who's next. Oh, my great pleasure um, to invite Matthew Wood from EFMD. And I think he's going to be speaking to us in his, in his capacity as, well, he's also a board member, but also as the editor of uh, Global Focus. John, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, what a great hour that's been just to hear what super things are happening. Very inspirational. I started at EFMD 20 years ago with my dear friend Anders, and in 2001, EFMD launched the Bangkok Manifesto, which started the Jiralai. So 20 years we've been talking about this, and I hope we're talking about it forever. But even in 1985, EFMD hosted a joint program with ASSB at Windsor Castle, hosted by Charles Hanley on where we're going with responsible leadership. And for me, so many brilliant things are being done, but we don't necessarily hear them or see them. So in my capacity of editor of Global Focus, which is EFMD's business magazine, it has a readership of around 30,000, which is pretty good. And John has written and Mark has written, and I tap into you all and Wayne has introduced me to Lars. So I, I thank you greatly for all your contributions. But what we'd like to do is do a special issue for the summer, the June summer issue, which is tied around the FMB's 50th anniversary, but also 20 years of GRLI. And we're a reflection on where we've come over the 20 years, but also picking into the network and saying, what projects are happening, what's, what are we doing, what's having impact, what's working, what's not. And I, I, I hear the six or seven things that could go in from there, but what John and I will do is we'll work on an editorial guideline and then we'll put a call out to get some input from you. We also publish, probably not all of it, but it goes into Chinese, it goes into Spanish, it goes into Russian. And I think one of the things I've always thought that the Jiralai is such a wonderful group, but we just need to raise awareness and amplify that voice. And if we can help in any way, then we'd really like to do that. And, and I'd also say, Chris, you, the, are we going to survive terrifies me with three children. But I, if we can help put that out onto the FM channels, we've got sort of 8,000 followers on LinkedIn now. We're happy to help the Jiralai. I mean, we founded it, we've worked with it. It's a passion for EFMD, it's part of, is embedded in everything we do, a lot of the ethics, responsibility, sustainability is in, in built into the accreditation, maybe some, not enough, we've definitely tried, we've been a voice for this, we've been thinking about this for a long time, there's a European approach to management that we're very passionate about, and I think the more conversations we can have about this, and the more we can help, then we're very happy to do I think probably in Jan, we'll come back to you with an outline and, and we want things that are just, you know, tell the story of the Jirai, but are also having impact. And that can be in a large context or a small context. And there's a very good point that I feel strongly about is we're often trying to get multinationals and global organizations to think about this. They are thinking about this, but there's so many smaller organizations that don't actually know where to start. So if we can have some impact in this and the SME program, etc., I've made some notes and Mark, if we can help support the stuff doing something about it and we all have to come to see I'm not sure that's going to be possible but wherever if and be can help via John via me connect on LinkedIn we're, we're delighted to help you thanks very much indeed wonderful thank you so much uh, Matthew and uh, yes so that's I think a very exciting announcement uh, the possibility of kind of celebrating 20 years since the Bangkok manifesto I think what we'll do in terms of celebrating the actual existence of GLI, that'll probably be a year or so later. But we thought that next year would certainly be uh, an appropriate time to have a, 
a, another special edition on, on uh, global responsibility. So that's great. I, I want to just start wrapping up this particular section before we take a break. And I think just before we do take a break, I'm going to hand over to Vanessa just to set up the reflection for the break. Let me just quickly share my screen. Um, and this, what you're looking at is, as you've just heard from various people involved in a number of actions, in recent board meetings, and it's also been a feature in the last Guardian meeting, we started distilling what I would like to call our aspirational mode for next year and maybe beyond into a very simple narrative and maybe just some context. Some of this was uh, drawn from our September board meeting, which was a generative discussion. It was not a formal, typical, traditional board meeting. It was very much a wide-ranging discussion about what's going on in the world and what we can do about it. And so this simple ABC narrative, uh, or the ABCs of GRI, that I think is, is starting to emerge as a story for us for the next 12 to 18 months, it is really the following. So on the A is that we will follow an action first mode of amplification. And I think we've already seen in just in today's AGM that as we gather momentum for 20 for 22, that it's very much about the actions. It's very much about acting the call and not just calling for more action. It's about the GLI being felt more. Uh, rather than being heard more. So that's the A. Uh, I think connected to that is that we know that it's important to uh, connect our actions to others and to build bridges from not just amongst our partners and our and associates, but also into other areas of inquiry and work between science and practice, between education and business and society, from the local to the global. It's very much about bridging within and beyond our ecosystem. So that's the B. And then the C, which I think is, has always been quite foundational to GLI's approach, is about catalyzing the connections for change. And more specifically, the whole person connections that are needed to sustain whole system change. We know that we need to deepen our critical awareness about the issues uh, that we're dealing with, that we that we continue to strive to be inclusive as possible in our relationship, that we bring in a diversity of voices that are perhaps not heard or maybe skeptical to our cause, but open to the dialogue. So it's really about lighting those fires that will attract the energy and the input from a, div a diversity uh, of voices um, and relationships. And maybe it's a good time also to remind our partners and associates that if you are a partner, you can name up to 20 individuals to associate with the GLI. If you feel that the conversation or the work in GLI is not diverse enough, utilize some of your spaces to bring in stakeholders in your community or connected to your institution that will perhaps bring a different perspective. I'm still waiting uh, for the day when one of the, one of the deans says, I'm inviting as my learning partner, a dean from the global south that is perhaps not able to participate in a particular activity, but I wanna make sure that it's not just a small and insular group talking. I believe there are other voices that, that needs to be heard. So I really wanna encourage uh, all of us to, to utilize that uh, feature of the GLI's engagement model. So just to, to wrap up our aspirational mode, action first amplification, bridge building, and then catalyzing the connections. I've got a, I've got a, a maybe even simpler way of putting it. And some of you may recognize some of this. So we're going to act ourselves into a new way of thinking and being. We're going to make the circle bigger and connect more of the dots. And of course, continue with driving relational innovation for the whole. So that whole would be, I think, an inclusive victory for people and planet. So that kind of wraps up this section. But it, as I hand over to you, I just want to make a suggestion that we keep the break to 10 minutes and not 15 minutes, if that's okay. Let me stop sharing my screen. Actually, I may need to the individual reflection questions again.
Yeah, if you, if you could pop yeah. the, your, your screen up, that'd be great, John, with the, the questions. But <clears throat> we're just going to take a little bit of time um, in the break just to pause. There's been lots of information shared. And just to reflect on the following questions, and um, with a real focus on, on the I and the we, actually. So having heard what you've heard, what might you want to get involved with or further with others, or perhaps give your support to to amplify action? Are there any other things that you would bring into the mix that you'd like to gather momentum with on others and to start to share or flag here for further dialogue into the future? And therefore, where's your head, your heart and your hands in the work of the Jira Line next year? So we are going to Im invite people to just either in the chat or just a couple of people to share their reflections. But if we break now for a 10 minute break, so back about half past two, with anybody who's prepared to share just a very brief reflection on those questions. Thank you, Vanessa. So if we can start coming back in, in here at around half, half past the hour, because over here it's half past four. So that's in, uh, So <laughs> we'll start in, in, in 10 minutes or so. Thank you very much. She said, Vanessa. Thank you. So, so just before we, we move into closure, really, we'd just love to hear from a few people who've had any instant reflections on those questions and just want to share something with the group. Just two or three people, but for anyone else who wants to say something, pop it in the chat because we'll keep that and um, we'll help us to connect with going forward. So if anybody would like to share something from their reflections, it'd be great if you could just pop your hand up or signal to me. Mark. Or not. Yep, Mark's got his hand up. Sorry, Mark. Mark, I can't see you. <laughs> so many faces. Thanks, Mark. You're right next to me in this top corner. Thank you. Um, I don't... <clears throat> it's not a fully formed idea, but in, in the spirit of just sharing things from the heart as in the Dean's cohort, I, I'm just going to go for it. <clears throat> so as you know, I've just resigned, I've arrived in South Africa and one of the really refreshing things, but also challenging things here is that, is that race is, and colour is right in your face. As a British man, I will do everything possible not to mention that that is a black person in front of me or that I'm pointing out the black person compared to the white person or the yellow person. In South Africa, I am completely liberated that. I can talk about race and colour as, as to the day till the cows come home, even in its both the major challenge we face and also the liberating that we can do that. What strikes me here is with what I sort of responded to what John said at the end about partnering up with people from the global south. Even the people here from the global south, with John, myself, Owen, I don't miss Arnold, we're also all white guys. <laughs> old white guys as well. And it's, it, we, this is something that is, a, it, this the lack of diversity in management education and the leadership of management education is a, is a problem, is a challenge that we all face and not being relevant for our students is something that's very pertinent for us in South Africa, but I think for us, it should be for us around the world. And perhaps GRLI has a responsibility there, but also a freedom we're not constrained by the same ways that maybe there's in these larger organizations with big constitutions and heavy organizations behind us. And maybe there's something we can do that's courageous in that space to, to do something. One, and one of the people at Stellenbosch University who's a, a black guy who works in a very eminent prof in, in education Said he challenged me as new director of the business school to say, Mark, this is on your, this is your, this is your responsibility. You've got to own this, and you've got to be lead the transformation of the business school. And uh, he laid the responsibility firmly at my door, in front of the whole school, 
and when should we invite him to talk about this topic? And he's right, and I think that's that. That also spans to us as well. And I don't have an easy, I don't have a solution, but I think there's something uh, courageous for us to do in that space. And perhaps, that, and I don't exactly know what it is. It could be something if you wanted to, if we wanted to show to start the ball rolling. It could be something like each of us are required to bring somebody from not not just wish, not just an aspiration, but it's actually you can't get in the door if unless you bring somebody from the global south with you you all of us must have a partners in in other institutions that are more diverse that we have to bring to this event and uh, i go and just the final point and owen will probably back me up on this as well the i go to sabsa which is the south african business school association or abs which is the african business school association and it's all black and i come here and it's all white and uh, we and i go and it's we're doing something wrong we're not talking to each other we're talking in our own groups and if you go to AA, ACSB, you go to the, uh, the diversity stream or the diversity deans, and it's all black. And, it, and then, then the rest of it is, uh, is mostly all white. And so there's something that we're not doing there. And I, don't, I, I think it's something we could perhaps, well, it's part of our responsibility. It's also about being relevant. Thank you, Thanks. Mark. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Some, some insight to consider there. And I'm just going to pass to Julia now, because I know in the chat you've shared some of your yeah. reflections. Thanks, Vanessa. I actually thought my chat would mean I wouldn't be sharing, but anyway, I'm, I'm happy to. Can you hear me okay? I'm getting a bit of an echo. Okay. So I guess two points and wearing two different hats. So one is in my new role as president of Yorkville University, we're working on something now I'm pretty excited about and it's signature learning outcomes. So the idea that regardless of our programs, we're gonna be aligning them against probably 10, what we're calling signature learning outcomes and included in that will be aspects of leadership, sustainability, ethics, social and positive social impact so i'm excited about that now now i get to play at the level of an institution but i'm still connected with lang and so happy to see ramina on the call and in fact i have a really active and amazing research team going with undergraduate and, and graduate students and there we're working on a number of projects really critiquing rankings and ratings and even the sdgs this idea of we're trying to assess the impact of scholarly work on the sdgs what we've discovered is the sdgs are actually a less than ideal framework given points of overlap and also missing elements anyway we've just submitted a paper that critique critiques the sdgs and makes makes some recommendations of how they could be a more useful tool and then we are shortly going to be um, sending off for peer review a paper doing a really comp comprehensive critique of the F-250 and that ranking as, as well as the 50 list of journals. So we've, uh, I'm so excited. The regression analysis we've done is pretty powerful and showing just incredible bias within the FT50 list in terms of its history and whose voices are being heard. And then finally, I'm working with the United Nations, so the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative and the Publishers Compact. And there we're actually, we have this audacious goal of fundamentally changing the peer review process so that when academics submit papers, to academic journals that the reviewers, as part of the reviewers remit, is to inquire if it's not obvious what the potential impact of the work is for the SDGs or to have positive social impact. And, and we think that could help influence academics to better align their work, to take it to the next step in their discussion, to imagine the potential positive impact, but also hopefully to change keywords. So bi bibliometric work will be able to be more, more accurate in assessing different journals and their overall alignment. So th those are projects I have on the go and I'm, I'm happy to 
we'll chat more about them with others when, when the time is right. And especially when we get our papers peer reviewed. So we'll see how we do going through that process. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Julia. I think we're probably wrapping up on time for this, but just encouraging just if there's anything else that you are um, holding either individually or as part of your institutions or connecting with others, just that will amplify bridge build or connect as per the ABCs that John, John has sent, just to keep sharing them and continue to do that in our communication channels. So thank you. Vanessa, just very quickly, it's been a really nice session and I'd just like to give great credit to John. He does a wonderful job on the shoestring and so do the guardians and everyone who helps him. So you get my great credit and thumbs up and, and look forward to seeing you when life allows it. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And we, uh, yeah, we'll get to some acknowledgements a bit later on, but yeah, thanks so much. So if there's, uh, I just want to check Vanessa. So there's no, there are no other uh, reflections that we want to hear now, just in terms of what was shared earlier on. And we can move on to the... Uh, John? Yeah, and if, if, if you have anything more you want to contribute to what is already ongoing or anything new, you may very well connect with, with, uh, with, uh, with the core team about that, around that. So you can do that either directly to me or uh, to, to or through John, right? Uh, Thanks, Anders. I think we've, we have one more contribution. Thank you, Anders. And then there's a, a, a wonderful offer from Kathleen in the chat. Please, everyone, have a look at that as well. And I think uh, JC, do you also want to just add something? Yeah, just a, a little thing. You probably heard once about Suri test. No, I'm kidding. We, we are in a new phase about that because we, we are doing something quite interesting. We are closing the fundraising campaign next week. So we will launch the certificate the kind of norm, international norm on what are the minimum thing that anyone, and I say anyone should know, really mainstreaming sustainability. And of course, if we want to have something intelligent, we need to co-build that. We're going to have different colleges, meaning NGO, corporation, ranking and assessment, a student organization. And I'm sure, of course, GLI will be somewhere for sure. And then, uh, yeah, it's more just keep in mind that uh, we will create something which could have a small impact and we will have some means to do it. So it's more just a seed and they will, we will come back soon. Right. Thanks. Okay, unless there's anything else, then I think we're going to move on to the next point. Um, and I'm going to ask Claire Maxwell, Claire, if you could maybe just as chair, just give us, just tee up the, the next point on the agenda which is around the proposal 30 for 30. Yes, I can. I thought you were going to do that. <laughs> oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I can do that. Uh, sure. uh, yeah, I'm happy to do it, John, but I, uh, when, when we spoke earlier. That's fine. So, so my apologies. So I think, as we've just heard, there's a huge amount of energy for a number of actions and initiatives. Uh, and, there, and there appears to be more things in the works that may require support. One of the conversations that was had at board recently was, was around our kind of operational capacity and the realities of our current financial configuration, which to put it bluntly, limits us sometimes in terms of pursuing new opportunities. Um, uh, there was a conversation about what might we do uh, to uh, support the core team, maybe create more capacity. But I want to, maybe just before I get to the proposal that's been put forward, I just want to touch on something that Mark Smith said, which is that it's having lived through a very formative time of my life through the transition 94 95 one moment being a being a, attending an all white afrikaans speaking boys school in pretoria 
and in the next moment being a waiter at uh, Mandela's inauguration, I saw this major shift uh, taking place. But it's not lost on me that, um, as, I, as Mark has pointed out, I'm a white male with an English name and surname. If I could maybe put on record that my wish would be that in a number of years from now, the role that I hold as executive director is held by a number of different people around the globe that is more representative of the globe. And that would be my wish. Having said that, we need additional capacity. We have a wonderful core team of kind of volunteers and part-time people. Claire Summer is supporting us with, with communication. We have some volunteers that have put up their hands recently to say that they can maybe also support some of that. We have the wonderful team at EFMD's finance department that helps us with finance. We have our, our committees that, that looks after the audit and the governance. We, of course, have you, our partners, driving the various initiatives. Our options when the board met was to either rationalize our activity, which I don't think we necessarily want to do, or to improve our internal efficiencies, sweat the assets, so to speak, see if we can squeeze more out of what we have, which is difficult. One, one way of doing that would be to say, okay, let's raise our partner fees so that we have some additional income in the partnership or become more efficient at the core. But I would argue we're pretty lean. And we've already, in principle, said, given the circumstances, we don't want to raise the partner fees. So it appears that some form of responsible growth is probably the way forward. But having capped ourselves at 25 full institutional partners, we don't want to go ahead and necessarily make that number much bigger. So the proposal was put forward that with our eyes on 2030 as our current kind of sunset period, that we put to the partners the proposal that we raise from 25 full institutional partners to 30. And that that would be the 30 for 30. And so in other words, that over the coming years, we recruit into the partnership category five additional seats, preferably beyond business schools. So I think with Montessori, we've already seen involvement from a group that is outside of our kind of traditional domain so ideally, if any of the partners do step back in course, because that happens from time to associate partner level, that would make space at partner level for more partners, maybe also from the Global South. But that these additional five seats would be to ideally put towards either companies or civil society organizations or other entities that are not necessarily business schools. So the proposal that we have is to support is to is yeah to make five additional seats uh, available. The reason we're bringing this back to the partners in the AGM is that whilst the board and the guardians, by the way, are supportive of this in principle, it is you, our partners, who need to say we don't object to this or we're okay with this or hang on, we've we've found some money somewhere we can support the GLI to recruit uh, some additional capacity. So that's the that is in just in a nutshell the the proposal. And maybe we can just spend a few minutes discussing that if need be. And and yeah, so let me let me open the floor on, on that point and let's just hold a discussion on that. Thanks, John. I'm on the board, so I'm not sure if my it counts, but I'm fully supportive of it, John. Uh, I, I always have been. I think moving to an extra five good partners is a very good idea. Thanks, Matthew. It'd be good to maybe just hear from some, from some of the partners in the room, Anne. John, I think it's a great idea, and I'm sorry I had to do something else for a second, so I might not have heard everything that you said, but. Um, also, has there been discussion about expanding the set of associate partners, right? Because you have a limit of currently 25 of the full partners, but there's a significantly smaller group of associate partners at the moment. Maybe expanding that group would be helpful. And I think so. I think you raise a very important point there, and which is that we haven't placed a cap on our associate partners per se. 
I think there was at one point a mentioned because we weren't sure what the uptake was going to be. But technically, we could recruit quite a few more into the associate partner level. And what we might even do is look, uh, obviously, depending on the outcomes from the cohort discussions, see whether the cohort going forward exists within the context of associate partner engagement if someone is not yet a, either a partner or an associate partner. I think the question at stake here is whether we increase the number of in full institutional partners, in other words, partners that can hold a seat on the board or on the guardian group, and that effectively steers the direction of travel of, of the GLI. But thank you for your comment about the APs. Yeah, I think that's a way to, again, as long as we're providing value, it's a way to increase revenues and support yeah. the infrastructure. Um, and then you may find, like you said, I'm hopeful that over time, if another educational institution steps out of the full partner position, that Mason may be ready to step up and be a full partner. Okay. But I think getting someone, thinking of it as a stepping, you know, as a ladder yeah. towards full partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's very encouraging to hear that. So thanks. And um, Chris, I see you have your hand up. Thanks. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. It may, The questions it raises for me is, how does it relate to this question of diversity that people were just talking about? Yeah. So do we consider that? And then how does it relate to the process of the kind of ecosystem reflection event that you're working with Sophie on? So do we do, how does that, if that gives us some glimpse into something that's missing in the system that you could respond to that? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think in terms of the diversity, as I, as I mentioned earlier, with the likes of Montessori joining recently, it's already a first step towards having at, at least a, in terms of focus area beyond exec ed, leadership development at exec level, learning and development in a company context or business school kind of activity. That's already shifted our borders. Uh, so the intention with adding five seats would be that those would be that those would be seats for entities or institutions that are going to bring different perspectives than what we already hold. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there's always for existing partners, there's always the possibility of enriching the conversation and the work by inviting people into the conversation as plus ones or as learning partners. But in terms of actually having a say in the future direction of the GLI in terms of either guardianship or board members or more broadly speaking, our strategic direction, we would be encouraging applications from entities that are beyond our traditional kind of engagement. Yeah, so I think that's very much the intention. In, in, with regards to the ecosystem, uh, again, I think that's what we're trying to do, Chris, is we, we're trying to say, how do we make this circle bigger in a responsible way so that as we, as we work with Oikos and hopefully others to hold up a mirror to the wider ecosystem, that it's not just the same people pitching up. So, Arnold, do you have a comment? Thanks, John. Uh Maybe testing while I support the idea fully. And my own sensitivity has, also, has always been that whenever I see fellow Africans, and I'm not talking about white South Africans, I'm talking about fellow Africans. Mm -hmm. On uh, at general eye events in the past, they've come once and never again. So I think we need to uh, have that sensitivity as well that this is not something that's about spicing up because very often afterwards when one debriefs with them you hear that sense of loneliness of being the kind of a singular outstanding ones in a crowd that they do not really know um, how to associate with how to talk to and so on it's a frightening experience sometimes for, for people so building scale in terms of diversity and building it as soon as possible, I think is going to be very important. 
and building it at the level of the partners, I think, is even more. So that means that the board composition will have to be influenced by it, the guardians will have to be influenced by it, uh, and the composition of this old group will have to be influenced by it. When you're part of the in-group, you really do not, I think, feel the pressure and feel the marginalization. But afterwards, when you talk to people about their experience, these are the things that come out. So I fully support it, but then it needs to be a strategically well-chosen, concerted effort in terms of, of uh, making this, this come about. And I think the time, if we claim that it's the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, there's no postponement uh, about this any longer. I think we really need uh, to put an urgency uh, behind this. Right. Thank you, Arnold. So I'm just looking um, around the room here. If Unless there's anything mm, very pressing around this that needs to be added, what I'm going to ask is, okay, Mark, you have something to add. I, very quickly, I should just I should acknowledge that my comments were, were partly based on some previous discussions I'd had with with Arnold and his insight and his courage that led, led to that, as well as with discussions inside the, the, the Stellenbosch and with my colleagues elsewhere. Second thing, I think you said about uh, the collaboration that we ha that GRLI has with GBSN. I think GBSN took a very, very deliberate decision this year with their conference, and you. There was a kind of step change in the diversity of their of, in, in their conference. Yeah. And I was talking to Rob, who's another South African uh, who's from around here, but he's actually did, did the conference from Washington. And they actually made a strategic decision at board level to really change the representation by gender and race of all the panels. And I think it was quite a different. It, it sent a really strong signal. I think that's that. so that I just support what Arnold said about it, you know, making that really. Yeah, courageous and deliberate decisions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. As a next step, I think it, what would be really good is if we could have from one of the part, full partners on the call just a proposal that we do this and someone to second it with the intention that we can share this with those who are not on the recording and if we have any objections by the end of this year or any major concerns raised about increasing the number to 30 that we then take stock again yeah sorry sophie did you want to add something oh no sorry okay no, i thought you were putting up your hand sorry so can, can i ask whether there is someone from amongst the partners that will propose this and someone that will second it Well, Loyola Marymount, um, speaking on behalf of Loyola Marymount, we would make the proposal. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, anyone to second? I'm happy to second it. Um, Julia, also second it as well, John. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So then, so basically what we have is at least from this group, we have agreement in principle that we're going to take this back to board to ratify. As I mentioned, we didn't, it was not necessarily the board or the guardian's decision alone, uh, but we will circulate with the partnership and there will be a, a, a period until the end of, of this year so that going into January, we know whether this is going to go ahead or not. But thank you very much to everyone who's giving your input and also we'll take all the comments that were made on board so i think that uh, concludes the 30 for 30 conversation and we are starting to wrap up i think that leaves us with the acknowledgements um, you can with great confidence hand over to me now john okay may i hand <laughs> over to you please <laughs> you may indeed, and I receive that with with uh, in preparation. First of all, I I just want to thank the partners and everyone on this call for all the contributions that you've made so far. 
in particular the last one this is a bit of a roundabout face but if i don't do it quickly john won't let me do it and he won't give me any time to do it i need to do this now which is your agreement in principle to increase the partnership enables us obviously to increase our resources increasing our resources enables us to increase our capabilities and also provides some much required support for John in his role as executive director of the GRL. I want to echo what Matthew said earlier. John does an extraordinary job, an extraordinary job and an extraordinarily brilliant job and has done especially this year when he has personally been ill with COVID, when we've had all the things that we've had to contend with, and he has held us um, together, and he's held the GRLI together in a way that I am in awe of his ability to do. And I just really want to acknowledge that quickly because otherwise he'll stop us quickly and won't let me. So if I may just have a collective for him, a whoop and a collective acknowledgement. Okay, you're released into the wild now, John. On behalf of John and myself now, I want to say a huge thank you uh, to our board, uh, many of whom are on this call. So if I may just ask you just to raise your hand so that people can see if you are serving on our board, who it is. That's great. Thank you, Julia, as well. I think you're, yeah. You serve with such diligence, such integrity, and such a commitment to global responsibility all year and all the time, and are so valued. Thank you so much. To our Guardian group and to Vanessa for holding it in the way that she does, but also to Anne and, and Jean-Christophe, I want to say, an au revoir. I have said to people before that this is the eagles, echoing the eagles, you can check out, but you can never leave. And also my personal thanks to you both as well uh, for the friendship, as well as the, as well as the huge work that you've done for the Giro line. As in all relationships, there are shifts and there are hellos and goodbyes. And so it's with regret that we say goodbye to Rob Whiting and Mary Godfrey from our board, who will be leaving in December. Rob, who's the former dean, many of you will know, is the former dean of Weatherhead School of Business. And Mary, who's the former director of Betty's and Taylor's group and a colleague of Vanessa's. Mary will continue as chair of the Oasis Foundation, so uh, Oasis as a partner of uh, of the Geraldi, so we will keep that connection going. And Chris, are you on the board of the uh, Oasis Foundation? Or oh, you're closely connected with it, I think, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So we, we will continue to have that relationship. We both have been major and invaluable contributors to the Geraldi. Both have been on cohorts and served on the governance committee and have really uh, contributed to the development of the Geraldi going forward. We are where we are because of them. Unfortunately, we can say hello to two new board members. Dale Smith, who is a colleague of Jeff's, who's on the call, is Dean of the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University, and is also president-elect of the uh, Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities. And in the spirit of catching them, people whilst they're fresh, before the exhaustion sets in, Dale has agreed to be part of the governance committee on the board. So we are, we are blessed in that respect as well. And our second new board member is Peter Mollegard, who is Dean of Maastricht University School of Business and Economics, and also chair of a global commission on climate change, which was started by the Danish prime minister. So we have wonderful new, we are losing, but we're also gaining tremendously. And I am really thrilled uh, and privileged to be holding the board on behalf of the GRLI with such esteemed colleagues. So thank you. Thank you, John. 
Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, just from my side, to acknowledge and thank the core team that supports the work of the GOI. Anders Aspling, who's always available for a call uh, day and night, uh, who's very much carries the spirit of the GLI in many ways. Thank you very much, Anders, for everything you do. Uh, then also within the core team, we have a very active chair of the board who often helps co-facilitate Dean's cohort meetings and does any, any and everything else that is needed. And it's wonderful, Claire, to, to have the privilege of working with you. And I know many people on, on this call are hugely grateful for everything you do for the GLI. And then, of course, Vanessa, who chairs the Guardians and joins some of the core team meetings uh, from time to time. And then, of course, holds the Guardian group. Um, and then, obviously, I, I speak at least twice a week with Claire Summer. And Claire has been instrumental in helping maintain our blog, our writing our newsletters, connecting with many of you on various issues of amplifying the GLI's work. So thank you very much, Claire, for everything you do. And I also want to mention, although very few of you deal with them personally, but they work in the background to ensure that our finances are in place. Angela Rojar and, and Delphine Ratan, and of course, our accountant, Andre Fizan. They are the team at EFMD who makes uh, sure that you receive your invoices and that you pay them on time and that our books are balanced. And then closer to home here, we have Marietta Strijdom. Um, Marietta, thank you very much for supporting the administration of the office. Yeah, that is just in terms of the core team, I wanted to acknowledge that. And then I want to thank you, our partners and our associates who carry the work of the GLI. I am incredibly uh, grateful for the opportunity to work with many of you and connect with you. And... Uh, I am, uh, I would like to extend just for this period that lies ahead, my best wishes and hope that uh, you will have some time of rest and reflection. And I look forward very much to everything that we're going to be doing next year. Uh, AACSB and FMD really provides a foundation to the GLI, has done so through many years. We're very glad that Oikos has recently joined as well. But I think having just also symbolically the two leading accreditation bodies provide a platform for our work. The various outlets, the affinity groups of AACSB, the Global Focus magazine and blog of EFMD, uh, the capacity that they bring in terms of finance support and administration. It is really with much gratitude and thanks uh, to, to Karen Beck Dudley at AACSB International and her team and to Eric Cornell and Matthew Wood and the team at EFMD for everything you do to help enable the GLI's work. So thank you very much to, to you as well. I think that is a wrap. I think and that's a wrap, John. We, we will be in touch with some emails and some feedback um, and some dates around next year. But thank you very much to everyone who, who participated today. Yeah, huge thank you. Thanks. A very good wrap, John. You, uh, Take care. Best wishes to everyone. Have a nice break. Best when wishes, Matthew. Right, cheers. Bye, everybody. Thanks for hosting us. Bye-bye. See you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Bye. Best wishes to everyone.